Welcome to Kapow. Mm. Comics. Check. Cartoons. Check. Collectibles. Yes, we have those also. Amazing. Mm. I'm Sonia. And I'm Al. Check. Yes. And we are back here at King's Comics, yes. thank God. After all the <laughs> flashing lights and dubstep that was the EB Games it Expo. It was pretty intense, but also amazing. But it is mm. nice to be back here at King's, giving my voice a bit of a rest yes. after having to do all that yelling. And hopefully we'll never have to hear Gangnam Style ever again. Ever again. Mm. All right, this week, guys, we're taking a look at Point of Impact yeah. as well as MacGyver. Yes, we will. And Ray will be coming along a little bit later. Now, because Ray just cannot get enough of Expos, Loves them. we packed him in a box and sent him over to Melbourne. Posted where him he, to Melbourne. He went to the uh, Armageddon Expo. Yes. Uh, where he talked to a lot of writers and saw a lot of very cool stuff. Absolutely. We'll be looking at that a bit later on. Mm. But right now, we're going to take a look at what the big two have been up to while we have been relaxing. Fantastic. Now, during the long, barren wasteland of YouTube between Kapow seasons, Marvel and DC kept themselves very, very busy mm. with some important things coming out afterwards. Yes, indeed they have, sir. Mm. So we thought it would be a good idea to have a little bit of a peep. A peep you know, if, if you will. Yeah, yes. At uh, what the big two have been up to in our absence. But being very, very careful not to spoil anything for mm. anyone who may have not, yeah. you know, finished a very important yeah. series. Yeah, that, yeah. So, know. for example, you know, we don't want to spoil the ending of Avengers vs. X-Men for anybody who might not have seen I've all apologized of the... yeah, it. I've Yeah, it will never be enough. Since you mentioned AVX, uh, that was obviously a huge event in Marvel Universe. Yes, it was. And with its conclusion, it's kind of heralded some really interesting changes. Yeah, it has, it has. I mean, it's been very much a case of out with the old and in with the new. Yes. With a lot of the major titles getting relaunches with new creative teams. Mm -hmm. We've got Iron Man, we've got Fantastic Four, we've got Young Avengers, even Ed Brubaker's seven year run moving from Captain America into Winter Soldier yep. is coming to an end. Yeah, and then there's the relaunch issue number ones which mm. will now be under Marvel, Marvel Now brand. Marvel Now. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. So you've got Indestructible Hulk, mm -hmm. Superior Spider-Man and one that's already on the shelves, Uncanny Avengers, uh -huh. which looks amazing. It does look pretty cool. It does. What I'm looking forward to though is all new X-Men yes. uh, because that's going to be written by Brian Michael Ben. Uh, with art by Stuart Imminent. We love both uh, of those. They're teams. both cool. They're I think amazing. it's going to be a good team up. Going to be very cool. Yeah, Marvel seems, among <laughs> other things, mm -hmm. they seem to be trying to blur that line between the, the mutant superhero and the regular superhero. Oh, common yeah, common or garden, garden variety. variety indeed. Superhero. Okay. <laughs> Which yeah. I think is a great idea yeah. and it's kind of going to lead to some really interesting team ups. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Tear down those walls. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, moving on to <laughs> DC. Indeed. Now, a whole year has passed since the new 52 was launched. Crazy. Did you realize that? It doesn't seem it that does long. It does not seem that long. Long. And so, DC dubbed September mm -hmm. Zero Month. Indeed. Yeah. So all the Zero issues basically covered origin stories from the New 52, unless that origin story had already been explored yeah. in, in the series. In those situations, yeah. it was more sort of providing some background or answering some questions that maybe weren't getting looked at in the main storyline. Um, now, I think it's some that, that really worked. Yeah. Um, Animal Man was one that I looked that at. That was really uh, cool. That was cool, because they really did change his whole origin story yeah. uh, in the New 52, so it was good to see that expanded on. Mm. Didn't work in all of them. Um, but that's always going to be the case when you apply the same gimmick to, I think, yeah, all 52 titles. All 52 titles, titles absolutely. Um, that's, that's always going to happen. Overall, it worked pretty well. Yeah, and not only that, but it was used as a platform to launch four new titles into the DC family. Mm. So we have Phantom Stranger, mm. Sword of Sorcery, Team 7, which I'm very keen to check yeah. out, and Talon. Yeah, now Talon was another one we looked at. We did. Uh, which was pretty cool. Um, it's... The issue itself didn't knock my head sideways, yeah. but I'm very excited for where that series has to go. And yeah. honestly, Scott Snyder hasn't let me down yet. Absolutely so, not. Yeah. And I think anyone who's read The Court of Owls kind of... Yeah. Th th it might be a nice little offshoot for them, because mm. it basically follows a Talon, who's the only one who's been able to get out of the court. Mm. And he's now basically running for his life from yeah. some really scary, from scary assassins. Scariest assassins of all time. So yeah. hopefully, fingers crossed, that will actually pan out to be quite yeah, an interesting, I, cool series. I have high hopes. Mm. Now, that's our little sort of brief... Peep at, at peep uh, little little peep <laughs> at uh, what the big two have been up to. Yep. But um, look, we'd love to know what you guys have been thinking about what's been going on. I mean, we have questions for you. So, you know, what new issues are you looking forward to? Will Marvel now breathe new life into marquee characters? Uh, which DC New 52s worked? Which didn't? Yep. Why is there a tiny hole in a biro? Don't think I'm that just, last I'm one's relevant. I'm just throwing questions. I'm going to see what okay, lands. Okay, okay. But we are keen to, to hear what you guys think hmm. of this. I mean, obviously, there's a huge range and we yeah. couldn't really go into all of it and Much like I said like I didn't want to yeah. spoil anything for anybody else <laughs> yeah, again but yeah. please get onto Twitter get onto Facebook let us know what you think of the relaunches of mm. Marvel and DC please Ray it is 
Good to have you back here at Kapow HQ. Thank you very much. Where have you been? I've what been have you been doing? Armageddon Melbourne. Amazing. I flew down, had a look at what was available, new collectibles, caught up with some of the riders. Yeah, it was great. Cool. You do like getting out to all those expos and things, don't you? I do, yeah. Just like seeing what the vibe's like and uh, yeah, just seeing how, how they all differentiate from one another. It's fantastic, yeah. So how was Armageddon then? Well, let me show you instead of talking about it. <laughs> I think I, good. I'm good. good. Sweet. Armageddon started in Auckland in 1995 and since then it has grown to become one of the major events on the pop culture calendar. So naturally, Kapow thought we'd come down and take a look in Melbourne, see what is going on here, meet some of the writers, the artists uh, at uh, Artist Alley and also have a look at some of the collectibles. That's what I'm keeping my eye on and perhaps we'll have a little fun while we're here. All right, let's go have a look. All right, guys, I'm here with the wonderful Ian Churchill. Uh, thank you for joining us on Kapow. You might uh, know his work of Deadpool, uh, Uncanny X-Men, and also, notably, Cable. So, and, oh. This is something that he wrote and illustrated himself called yeah. Marine Man. Can you tell us a little bit about Marine Man? Marine Man is so, serious? Yeah. It's a dream come true, really. It's, Beautiful. It's something I always wanted to do. Your baby? Um, it is, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I uh, created it when I was eight years old. Wow. 1977. Um, and I got the uh, the go-ahead from Image to, to give it a go and they published it. Um, and it's just been brilliant. I've um, got a lot of families come to shows and yep. kids love it. Um, right. And I've had a whale of a time. What was, you know, what inspired you to write this at eight years old? At eight, the old Jack Cousteau stuff, actually. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was a big fan of his documentaries. I used to watch them with my granddad when I was a kid. Yeah. And the word Marine kept cropping up. And, you know, I loved superheroes. And uh, I don't apologize for that. I still love superheroes. <laughs> Great. Um, and uh, I love the um, bright colors that I'd, use, I'd see in the comics at the time and what have you. And I kind of wanted to emulate that when I got. I mean, the character evolved over the years. It, yeah. it was very much uh, a simplistic character when I created it because I was only eight. But, um, you know, it's one of those characters I kept coming back to. Mm. Um, it was one of my first um, creations. Right. And uh, as, it, as it evolved over the years, I kept thinking, oh, I could just add that bit and add that bit. And it, it, it grew into a, an underwater character which was different to the Marvel and DC ones. Yeah, great. Something that, you know, I figured if I was going to do this, I had to make it as different as possible. Right, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago we took a look at this figure on Facebook, a little bit of a mini review, but here at King's Comics at Armageddon they actually have a prototype of the statue. It's available for pre-order now, but this is just a prototype version, it's unfinished, there's still a few little minor touches still to go on this design. Basically, we have the sixth scale Batman by Jim Lee. Now it's based on Jim Lee's unique vision of Batman. The armor itself is made of 85% die cast metal alloy. It's incredibly heavy for a sixth scale figure. Also has 50 points of articulation, which is fantastic. The good thing about this statue is it, it strikes a fine balance between being a statue and a figure. Unlike other sixth scale figures like uh, your Hot Toys, which look a bit more like dolls, uh, this here can also stand as an individual museum piece. What is great about this also comes with the uh, posable uh, and removable cape. At the moment, it doesn't have the magnets to attach to Batman's shoulders, but it will have. It also comes with the Batarang and grappling hook accessory, and this great dragon gargoyle, which will be a, a magnetic base for Batman to pose on. It's a fantastic figure. Uh, it's a big buy from me, and uh, yeah, it's available for uh, pre-order right now. I'm gonna get me one. Got Brick. All right, I'm here with Bob Layton, who's a bit of a legend in the comics industry. He's a writer, artist, director, editor, and entrepreneur. Tell, tell me, have I've you done, had to... I've done, I've done everything but put staples in the books, 
Have like you had to stay yeah. flexible uh, because of the, the industry or because you like to challenge yourself? No, no, what, well, one, yeah, of course, challenge yourself. I mean, yep. what, what artist in any art field doesn't grow? You know, right. and the ones the ones that don't obviously don't last. That's right. But I was um, I was very fortunate to be mentored by a couple of really you know great artists, and one of the things they inculcated in me was uh, to learn all aspects of it and treat it like a business. Yeah, right. That in fact, even though it is you know, you know comic you art, it. something I love. Yeah. At the same time, you you it's a business, and and uh, I because I, people get upset sometimes when I say that I don't read comics. Yeah. But I haven't read comics in a long time. Wow, yeah. Well, because, and I equate it to being, when I run my companies, I, I equate it to being a cocaine dealer. Yeah. You can't be a dealer and a user, you know, and do it efficiently, you yeah, know? That's right. And and so my uh, Dick Giordano, who's my, one of my mentors, uh, and the one I credit the most, said to me, if you're going to do this as a profession, you got to give it up as a hobby. All right. You know, and so... Uh, that's why I, I tried to learn every aspect of it. So, you know, at, first I started out as an inker, then I was a penciler, and then I became a writer. Wow. Uh, all, all that was within my game plan. And then from there, I was the editor, and then, you know, I, I owned two comic book companies. And, uh, you know, wow. and now I'm, I'm out in Hollywood because, you know, there was the only thing my characters haven't done is talk and walk. So that right. was the next real the next logical progression. Yeah. Some of our viewers might not know that uh, in the late 70s, you were largely responsible for saving Iron Man. How did that unfold exactly? Well, it, it was kind of easy actually. Yeah. Uh, David Michelini and I had, had formed our partnership at DC Comics like the year before that. It was like 77. And I, this is David. Yeah, I'm old, okay? <laughs> but I was a teenager then, all right? Um, and what happened was we saw that they were going to have a big cutback. We, we kind of felt it coming at DC. And I had worked at Marvel the previous year, and I said, well, I convinced Dave to go. And Dave had never been a Marvel guy. He'd always been kind of a DC guy. Yeah, right. So he wasn't like real familiar with the characters. So uh, I convinced him to jump ship. So we went over and worked, applied for a job together as a team, as a you know, you know co-plotting writer, inker team. All right. Which was weird enough right there, because there yeah. never been such a thing. But uh, they had a, like three books available, and they were, all in, they were all labeled to be canceled. They were all scheduled to be canceled. All right. So they figured these punks, they couldn't hurt them, so Clowns. they said, well, so they were using them like tryout books. Yeah, right. So they, uh, they had, like, Ghost Rider was one of them, I think, and, and when they said one of them was Iron Man, I, they, I said, do Iron Man, do Iron Man, <laughs> trust me, trust me, trust yeah, me. Yeah, right. Because as a kid, I had made my own Iron Man comics. It was one of those things that I always saw the potential in that character, and I always hated what they did with it. Yeah, right. And and it's like because it never looked like armor, and it's like Tony Stark was just kind of a, a facade. Mm. And I was like, as a kid, I'd much rather be Tony Stark than Iron Man. I mean, yeah. You know, it's like that's the life. Yeah. So the whole rock star persona of Tony Stark kind of came in with that. So. They gave us pretty much carte blanche to do whatever we want. So we came in, as you notice, the first couple issues, we kill everybody. Yeah. You know, we brought in a whole new supporting cast of characters and changed the direction of the book. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, you've got something uh, pretty close to your heart, uh, Colony. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, in fact, uh, I was supposed to have copies here, and IDW said that they couldn't get them here from the uh, printer. That's time. a shame. Yeah. yeah but uh, it's uh, 164 page. It's 150, I believe. All oh, right. 64 with the text. Oh yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's Dick Giordano's last work. Yeah, he was uh, able to finish it before he passed away a couple of years ago. So um, very special work. Yeah, very special work for me. Yeah. In fact, it was it was hard because I spent the last two weeks of his life in the hospital with him. Yeah, and uh, it took me a year before I could get that, get up the nerve to eat those pages because I would just yeah. get so emotional. Yeah, you know when I thought about him or whatever, you know, because like, yeah. he was like. He was like a father to me. Yeah. So it was a uh, great. So this book is really like a labor of love, and it was the last thing he ever did. And it should be on the books bookshelves next week. Awesome. So. Awesome. And it, it's a great book for uh, all my uh, Australian friends because I kind of used used Australia as as my inspiration for it. Awesome. You know, it's it's basically the history of, uh, of, of this this country in space. Great. Yeah. Can't wait to uh, get a copy. Oh, thanks very much for taking time to speak with us today. Oh, yeah, okay. This yeah. is great, you know. No worries. That is 
awesome. It looks like you had an amazing time at Armageddon. I did, I had an awesome time. Yeah. One of the best things about the exhibitions, uh, though, is what happens outside, not necessarily what happens inside. Cool. Outside, there were so many people hanging out, just a real sense of community, though. I was sitting on the ground, swapping cards, playing cards. They are out in the park, they are kicking a ball around, they were cool. Gundam dancing. <laughs> uh, there was heaps of cosplay photos, of people, yeah, lining up all over the place, doing all sorts of silly stuff. And I don't know, that was, that's that sense that's of community. That's a nice kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's nice meeting new people with, you know, the same interests and stuff. That's what it's about, I reckon. That's cool. Well, thank yeah. you for being a roving reporter once uh, again. Anytime, love it. Oh, I know you do. Yeah. You do. Oh, we'll see you next week, though. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Bye. <laughs> Bye. If you have ever seen a paperclip, a rubber band, and a pair of chopsticks and thought to yourself, I could make a rudimentary helicopter out of those things. Chances are, like me, you grew up watching MacGyver. Yeah, now on the other hand, some people may only know MacGyver from references in The Simpsons. Sure. Like, you know, don't thank me. Thank <laughs> the moon's gravitational pull. But either way, you're probably going to be aware that MacGyver was a guy who ran around during the 80s uh, getting into adventures and stopping bad guys with a roller gaffer tape and a Swiss army knife. And a mullet. Yes. Never forget it's MacGyver's mullet. It's impossible to forget the it's mullet. Amazing. Now, <laughs> you've got to remember now, he's actually made the transition hmm. into comics. He has. With a new five issue miniseries with Image called Fugitive Gauntlet. The series is written by Tony Lee with Lee David Zlotoff, mm. who incidentally created the character of MacGyver for the TV series. Yeah. So I was pretty confident going in that it was going to be a faithful adaptation. Yeah, and did you feel that way having finished reading it? Yes and no. Yeah. It, it did have that kind of punchy pace that the TV series yeah. has, with Mac pretty much being thrown into danger from the first Straight page. That, yeah. You find out that there is a price on his head, mm. which is $7 million. That's fine, but it goes down every day hmm. by one million, so yeah. it keeps that pace up. Yeah, I think I, I actually did think that was a good way of manufacturing a kind of an urgency to the story. Yeah, now yeah. add to that ducking Interpol, mm -hmm. as you do, yeah. and also trying to find a guy who's stolen some top secret biological information that just happens to have been written by Max College Professor. Yeah. It's, don't question it. Don't just, question just, it. It's just go with it. It's MacGyver. <laughs> MacGyver. <laughs> you got to go with it. And the thing is, I, there's a lot going on in there here. Is. And most of it was pretty good. Oh. I quite enjoyed it. I mean, you even get to see a couple of times he's doing his, his classic trademark jury rigging of various well, things. you got to. It's well, MacGyver. You know, he's describing <laughs> the whole thing as he's doing it. And this is how I'm making a bomb <laughs> out of jelly, jelly beans. beans. Seriously, that's in there. So, you know, that, I thought that was pretty yeah. good. Yeah. But... If there is something that lets this comic down, yeah. it's the artwork. Okay, yeah. the the art is well, it's it, it's bad. Look, let's yes. let's not mince words. I don't want to be a jerk here, but it's it's not good. It's not I mean, we got Will Sliney, oh, Sliney, Sliney. Not sure about the pronunciation, but he did the uh, the pencils and the inks for mm -hmm. this, and I was not impressed. I really wasn't. I mean, the character models are blocky, a bit ugly. The backgrounds are mostly empty, and yeah. he has this unfortunate habit of shading <laughs> in people's noses so they look like koalas. It's true. What's that about? That was weird. Yeah. But the thing that annoyed me the most was why did MacGyver have stubble? That's what bothered like, you. Yes, it, MacGyver is a clean-faced <laughs> American action star. He does okay. not have stubble. Okay. I'll deal with the fact that they got rid of the mullet. Yeah. Fine. We're yeah. putting MacGyver into a new kind of it's territory. Con it's contemporary. I can cope with that. that. That was fine, yeah. but not the stubble. Okay. There was a saving grace in the artwork for me, which, which was, was Kieran hmm. Lucas, who uh, does yeah. the colours for it. I hmm. think he did a beautiful job. Yeah. It was a really rich, varied palette and it really appropriate for everything that went on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the colours were good. Some of my favourite panels were just the colours. It didn't save it from the bland visuals. Mm. I gotta say, you know, that it just it wasn't enough to save it. Um I'm really much of two minds yeah. with this one, you know? I think there was a lot in here that I really enjoyed, but I've got to wonder, is that because I grew up watching this? Exactly. How is somebody who's never seen MacGyver going to respond to this series? I, I kind of think the same way. Like, mm. MacGyver was such a huge influence on my child. I wanted to be MacGyver, basically. <laughs> so coming against this comic, I really loved it, but that artwork really yeah. drops it down. Yeah. For me, it makes it a borrow, a nostalgic okay. MacGyver borrow. Okay. I, I'll check it yeah. out still. All right, well, look, I'm giving it a borrow as well, yeah. but a wait for the trade borrow, certainly. It's only five issues, so yeah. you so can you, do that. It's not going to be too hard to wait, mm. but... I think there's a lot in there. It looks like it's going to be fun, yeah. but I get the feeling it's not going to be worth more than a couple of reads. Yeah. Um, so I'm definitely giving it a borrow at best. And even then, got to say, that's coming from somebody who watched this stuff growing mm. up. So if you've never seen MacGyver, it's possible you may have to 
downshift that to a berry. Nostalgic borrow or no MacGyver berry? Yeah. Oh, don't bury MacGyver. It's just a partial, it's like up to the waist. He'll get out. It's MacGyver. He'll always get With out. With a popsicle stick. Popsicle stick. Yeah. And a spoon. And a paper clip. Nice. Point of Impact is a new four-part crime noir series from Image, uh, written by Jay Farber, which revolves around the murder of a young woman called Nicole Rafferty and the investigation that follows on afterwards. Now, the hook for this series is that it's not just the police who are investigating this crime. Yeah. There are three different parties who are trying to piece together the events that led to Nicole's untimely and rather brutal death. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a little concerned when I sort of checked it out before I read it. It was going to be a bit by the numbers. Yeah. I mean, you know, young woman gets chucked off a building, Let's figure out why. Seems pretty straightforward, <laughs> but as you say, it's that three-pronged investigation that actually puts this in a different place. Absolutely. So yeah. you've got the detective who's leading the investigation, mm. who did actually know Nicole when she was alive. Yeah, you've got her husband, who's an investigative reporter, mm. so obviously he's in on the game. And you have Nicole's secret lover, mm. who just happens to be ex-military. <laughs> yeah, so he kind of fulfills that private detective yes. archetype Strong in many ways. Strong jaw, brooding eyes. Yeah, I mean, they are all kind of archetypes, mm. but it's actually their relationship relationship with Nicole and the different images that they had of her that makes it interesting. Throw in a masked assailant mm. and a possible conspiracy and as we said only a four issue run yeah. and this title moves along at an absolute cracking pace. Yeah I mean it's not action packed no. is it? I mean it's mostly just people talking. I mean there is that one uh, fight that happens in this first cool. issue that I thought was really well drawn. I really, yeah. I really enjoyed that but I mean it does still have a great sense of momentum to it. It yeah. does. It's, it's more of a thriller than it is an action Absolutely. Yeah. But that fight scene in issue number one mm. is spectacular. You yeah. can almost feel the impact of yeah. those punches. It's the one he just gets right oh, in the face. It's I, brutal. Yeah, that was good. Corey Curanel. Sorry if I've mispronounced your name, mm -hmm. but he is a relative newcomer in the comic book world and yeah. he has done an absolutely fantastic job with the artwork in this series. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I, I thought to start with that it was a little bit too Sin City ish, yep. but I think that was just the second second page. There's just this one image where Nicole's done her swan dive onto the top of a car. It's nasty. And it's the framing, it's the fact that it's in black and white, it's the content mm -hmm. that all put it in that kind of Sin City area for it me. Did. Once I was a few more pages in, I could see that Coronel really does have his own very individual style. He does, and it is a comic that really could only be done in black and white. Oh, absolutely. Really, yeah, there's, no, there's, there's no there's no colour in this. There's some black and white ones where it feels like they just haven't coloured it in yet. <laughs> this one, just the use of shadow and everything, it had to be done this yeah. way. Now, look, mm. overall, there is no fault for me with the artwork or mm. the story. I'm really into this. You've got conspiracy theories, you've got crime noir, you've got fantastic artwork. Mm. It's a buy from me, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Look, I do really enjoy these short runs that tell their story at yep. a breakneck pace, gets you done, you're out of there. Done. You know, I always <laughs> enjoy that. I mean, this one, it's it's not reinventing the genre, no. but it's given a little tweak that makes it really interesting. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm definitely, I mean, it's not a big investment of my time. It's only four issues. I'm definitely going to buy this one. Excellent. Well, that's all we have time for you this week, guys. But never fear, we will be back next week. Yes, next week. Yes. And you know what next week is, don't you, Sonia? My birthday. No, that was more than a week ago. That's true, it was and like a fortnight ago. I, yeah, and I, I <laughs> promise I will get that present to you. But no, next week mm -hmm. is All Hallows oh, Eve. Exciting. So we'll be looking at some horror titles. We'll be looking at Ribbon, mm -hmm. and we'll be looking at Whispers in the Walls. Amazing things mm. that go bump of the night and scare the bejesus. Possibly tip your... What? If we're looking at scary things yeah. and it's Halloween, mm. do I have to look at zombies? You, don't you, make me look at zombies. No, I don't want to look at zombies. That. Everyone you, knows that I don't like zombies. We'll see. We'll try to avoid zombies. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not making any promises. All right, guys. We'll see you next week and there will be no zombies. We'll see. No. Bye. Bye, guys. No zombies. I'm not looking at zombies. Don't get zombies. Rain.